A number of years ago, I talked to a man who was new to our church, and he said, I like the church, but I could do without all the sing time. (laughs) Uh, I understand the sentiment. However, what he's missing, and what many of us know, is that when we come and worship with our voices and song, God does something in our hearts. Uh, It's easy to get distracted and forget who is Lord and who's on the throne. And when I hear God's people around me, singing with me, being led, it's good to be reminded of who God is and who we are as his people. And he speaks to us even through our worship together. Now let's pray once more as we open God's word. Father, thank you for this morning and a chance to be together. Forgive us for the way that we get distracted and fail to live up to the call on our lives. In this moment, we turn our hearts and minds to your word and ask you to speak to us. We've told us your word is living and active, and we trust that you will say what we need to hear. We pray it in your name. Amen. We're in a series called Face to Face, uh, looking at uh, face-to-face encounters in the Gospels, people who met Jesus face-to-face and had their lives changed or he confronted them in some way and, and so that we can learn about who he is and how we can meet him in our day as well. And we're looking at a story that will be familiar to you, if not by the reference, certainly by the, 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 uh, the content. Uh, it's Jesus and a man known popularly as the rich young ruler. So if you've got your Bibles, open to Mark chapter 10. Uh, I'm going to read uh, from the English Standard Version. You can follow along on the screens. Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 27. Let's stand together for the reading of God's word. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I've kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, You lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man it's impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. You may be seated. As I said, it's a familiar story. You've probably heard the topic or the title, um, and sometimes familiarity can get in our way of hearing what God has for us, so I hope and pray that's not the case for us today. God's been speaking to me through this story and new ways. So what do we know about this guy who meets Jesus face to face? He shows up in three of the four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We call those the synoptic gospels because they have a lot of overlap. They share a lot of the same timeline and stories. And this guy is, this encounter is recorded in three of the four gospels. We know that he was wealthy and rich. All three uh, tell us that, that he had great possessions, great wealth. We know he was influential. Luke tells us he was a ruler. We don't know exactly what his title was, but he had a position of status and importance in the community, the Jewish community. He was also not an old guy. He was young. Matthew tells us that, that he was youngish. I think of myself as a young man, but I'm watching the Olympics, and I realize that most of the athletes are younger than my children. I realize I'm not young. (laughs) I am not a young man. So, So also we know this guy comes to the right person, Jesus, in the right posture, on his knees, asking the right question, about eternal life, about, about eternal things. So he's a moral man, a respected man, a wealthy man, a humble man on his knees, a intellectually and spiritually curious man asking questions. By all accounts, this is a good guy. Some people in the Gospels ask Jesus questions, and their questions aren't genuine. You, you, we've seen those, right? They're asking questions, but they're trying to trap Jesus. This is not that. This is, by all accounts, a good man, by any standard, a respected good guy. Yet for all of his relative goodness, he, he feels like he's missing something. What must I do? It's not enough. Maybe he wonders if he's really good enough. 
And this raises a question I want to talk about for a minute. The question of goodness. The question of goodness. We see it right in the very first couple of verses, uh, verses 17 and 18. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and asked him a question. So first of all, it's just interesting that he, that he runs up, isn't it? He's eager. And asked him, the teacher, good teacher, there it is, good. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Three times this word good is used in there. I like Mr. Goodbar, by the way. <laughs> I don't know why I thought of that. We use the word good all the time. And it's sort of a meaningless word in English. Well, what's, what's being talked about here? What, are they, what is he referring to? Good teacher. Jesus goes, hold on, time out. Do you know who you're talking to? Do you understand who you're addressing this question to? No one is good except God alone. Why are you calling me good? And what's behind this man's question? Am I good enough? Have I done enough? Is it enough? I feel like it might not be. I think most of us, though we wouldn't say this, think about goodness in terms of like a, a morality ladder. So I'll try to draw this image for you here. Um, so we, if we put God up here, at the top, of course, he dwells in unapproachable glory and light. So there's the cloud and the glory. You get the idea. And there's a ladder coming down from God. And so on this ladder, we, we would place our people that we think are good people somewhere. And at the bottom, everybody always uses this, so we'll just say it, Hitler. <laughs> a guy last hour said he was out in the lobby. He goes, I saw you t talk about Hitler. I thought, what? I'm missing something. Anyway. Well, whatever, just the worst person you can imagine, right? And, you know, the Apostle Paul, he's not, he's not God, but he's got to be up here somewhere. I don't know, like Mr. Rogers, maybe in the middle. <laughs> Nelson Mandela, I don't know where he would go, somewhere above, we'll put him right here, I don't know. A good person, who are the good people you know about? Rosa Parks, where would you put her? Yeah, Gandhi, right, so you'd start ranking the moral goodness of people that we know about. Where do they fit? Well, now we have to ask the question, what about you? Are you going to put yourself, not above Paul, but in here, above Mandela? Below? How far below? You say, well, I'm not Hitler. <laughs> but like, where do you put yourself, right? How do you know? And, and then when you, if you can figure that out, how do you know, well, what rung is high enough? Where, where is he good enough? Did, did God, is God looking down and going, well, I'm drawing the line here. Eh, you know, where exactly? And I think this is part of the assumption behind this man's question. And here's the first thing we see in this story. Jesus confronts this man's and our false assumptions. And when the guy says, uh, you know, what must I do? Jesus says, why do you call me good? And then he goes right into what might be shocking to us. Quoting the Old Testament law. Look at verses 19 through 20. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these I've kept from my youth. And you might pause and go, really? All of them perfectly? That's what he says, and Jesus doesn't contradict him. And it is a little bit surprising to think Jesus is quoting the law as a way of answering the question about eternal life. We know uh, from the rest of the New Testament that you can't keep the law. That's why we need grace. So it's a little bit strange to see Jesus quoting the law as the answer to the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? But there's more going on here that's easy to miss at a, like a surface level reading. And I want you to see this. Jesus cites five of the last six commandments. You see them right there. Do not murder do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And the last of this of, of commandment, do not covet, he leaves out. Now that's, by the way, Jesus is never doing anything randomly. Like none of this, he's never doing anything like, ah, just, you know, he's just throwing them out there. This is intentional. He's quoting five of the last six. He does not quote the tenth or the first four. And if you know something about this, the, the, the last six commandments have to do with our horizontal relationships, how we treat one another. You see it right there, right? Murder, adultery. People always say, well, I haven't killed anybody, right? Murder, adultery, stealing, bearing false witness. It's all about how we treat each other. The last one, covet, 
is kind of a both and. It has to do with like needing things so badly that they take the place of God in our hearts. And he doesn't quote at all the first four. Here's the point. Jesus is by omission saying something really important to this man and to us. What do the first four commandments have to do with if the last six are horizontal? Vertical. And you know the first commandment, of course, right? Should I make you say it? In case you're wondering, here it is. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. So the first commandment's right there. I'm first, God says. I should be number one. And that is kind of on the nose of what this guy's issue is. Jesus is saying it without saying it. Do you get it? He quotes the ones he knows the guy will say, yeah, yeah, I'm doing those. And Jesus doesn't contradict him, although he could have. He could have said, really, you've kept them all? What about this time and this time and this time and this time? But on a relative scale, the guy is a morally pretty good person. People would have backed that up. He's been fair, he's been honest, he's a good man. Now we're starting to see what Jesus is driving at here. When this man claims to have obeyed all the commands, Jesus lets that go. It's like this guy saying, you know, I've done everything right. I've been successful, I'm respected in society, I'm morally upright, and I'm faithful in my religion, but I just feel like I'm missing something. Jesus is saying, you are. His false assumption is that he thinks what he's missing is something he could add or earn. I think this is true for many, many people in this room. We approach faith like it's an additive to our already pretty good suburban existence. I've got, my, my kids are doing okay, my, I got my business in order, I'm doing pretty well, my, my life is good, but I'm missing something. I could add in a little religion, a little spirituality, a little Jesus. I've told this story many times, but I, I love telling it and it fits. Years ago when I was coaching my son's like flag football team, one of the boys on the team, his dad found out that I was a pastor and he came up to me and said, huh, not what I expected. <laughs> I wasn't sure what to think of that. And then he said, um, I should come to your church. I could use a little Jesus in my life. I said, well, he wants to be in your life, but he's not little. There's no such thing as a little Jesus in your life. Like, you know, little Jesus, little Jesus. I like little Jesus. I'll put him in my pocket and keep him till I need him. That's not how it works. This man has come to Jesus. What, what must I do? Do you notice this question? What do I have to do? Is there something I need to learn? Is there some knowledge I don't yet have? Is there some religious duty I must perform? I'll do whatever it takes. I mean, I'm doing pretty well, but I, I want to know what do I have to add in to make sure that I'm good? If you try to build your faith on what you have to do, add, or earn, it's exhausting. You'll never have the life Jesus is offering. You'll never really understand grace if you're trying to add something or earn something or do something. And this brings us to the second point. Jesus lovingly diagnoses our core issue. He lovingly diagnoses our core issue. This guy's saying, I know that I'm missing something. Just tell me what it is, Jesus. Just say it and I'll get right on it. I'm a man who likes to accomplish things. Jesus has already hinted at this when he says, why do you call me good? But now he's going to tell him. He's going to answer the question directly, and the guy's not going to like it. Be careful what you ask Jesus for. Be careful what you pray and ask him to make clear to you. Because the, the hammer is about to fall, and it's going to hurt. Look at verses 21 through 22. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Don't miss this. Everything that's going to come after this, everything Jesus is going to say to this guy that sounds harsh, even his response, all that flows is flowing out of that statement. He loves this guy. He loves him enough to tell him the truth, the hard truth. And said to him, you lack one thing. Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. 
It's a shocking statement to say to this guy, especially in a culture that viewed possessions as, as divine favor. Not so much today, although perhaps still to a degree, we think of like, well, he's doing pretty, must be doing something right. He's pretty successful. She's doing well. Certainly in that culture, wealth was seen as a blessing from God. And so this man, rightly in the culture, wrongly not now we know, but in his, he un- understandably at least, thinks what I have is a sign that God is favoring me. Now you're telling me to give it away? It's the thing that I'm sort of basing my sense of significance on. Now you're saying let it go? I mean, sell it all? Think about that. Think about what he's saying. This is not a 401k or an ATM he can go to. Wealth was in land, livestock, possessions. Sell it. Sell it all. Liquidate all of it. Give it away. I mean, it's, it's a overwhelming thing to ask. You, you know, um, I used to watch the old kung fu movies when I was younger, you know? And it was like the kung fu master could like reach in and grab the heart and pull it out while it's still beating. I know it's kind of gross. But in my mind, it's kind of like Jesus has just grabbed this guy's issue, pulled it out, like the thing in his heart, and holds it up to him and says, this. Give me this. Not that. Not that. Anything but that. I mean, I'll, I'll say all the prayers and do all the stuff, but don't make me give up that. And that's the core issue. And you've got that thing. And I've got that thing. What would it be? That Jesus would reach in, grab hold of it, it's painful, and pull out and say, to have the life I'm offering you, you gotta release your grip on this. Let me have it. Whatever that thing is, that's your functional God. It might seem harsh to say to this morally good guy, give it all up. But don't forget, he's doing it because he loves him. And notice it says that he, it says that he looked at him. Looking at him. That's the Greek word ablepo. It means a penetrating gaze. You ever talk to people that, that make too much eye contact with you? It's like, yeah, <laughs> dude, look, look away for a second, you know? Like right, you know? We did a seri- uh, some training years ago on our staff for emotional uh, intelligence, and one of the ac- exercises was to sit and stare at each other on staff, like a person like right next to you. It was, we still laugh about that. That was awkward. Really awkward. So Jesus is not just like, it's, it's saying he's staring into this guy's soul. The penetrating gaze. I see you. I see it. I see what you're holding on to. I see what you have a white knuckle grip on in your heart. And that's the thing. You're asking, I'm going to tell you that. Looked at him and loved him. The Greek word there is gapo. Where we get the gape, divine love, perfect love. I, I just want to pause there for a minute. You know that God sees you? I ask this question all the time, but what do you think God thinks when he looks at you? What do you think comes into God's mind when he looks at you? you? And by the way, he's looking at you all the time. How many of you, I'm going to guess, I don't don't have to guess, I'll bet most of you, your thought is, well, I know that he loves me, but. But I'm a screw-up, but he's probably irritated, but he's losing patience, but I ought to be better than I am. No, that's what you think of you. That's not what God thinks of you. I wrestled with this when I was on leave. God's looking at me with judgment and condemnation, you know? He's looking at this guy who's morally good. Everybody loves him. And going, ah, but there's something that's missing. And you feel it, but you can't name it. So I'm gonna name it for you, he says. And he does it because he loves him. But in our culture today, we think that uh, to tell somebody something that's contrary to what they want to hear is not loving. We're sort of conditioned to think that if you say anything that's not 100% affirming of somebody, that it's unloving. And we, certainly there are times when love should believe in, affirm, encourage. But there are also times when true love corrects, redirects, challenges, convicts, even rebukes. It's because he loves us that Jesus would challenge us. 
convict us, confront us. It's because he loves me that he's done that in my life. It's because he loves you. If you read things in his word, if you hear things from his spirit, if a friend that you know you can trust because they love Jesus says something to you that you don't like and it's hard to hear but you know it's true, that is coming from the love of God for you. Notice the guy doesn't walk away angry or indignant or irritated. I could get that, right? If he walked away like, pfft. like if he came to Jesus, comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus goes, sell it all. He could walk away and go, that's ridiculous. This is the sign of God's favor and blessing. This is how I bless the world through my generosity. He clearly was the wrong guy to ask. He could, he could sort of rationalize it and walk away irritated, right? But he doesn't. How does he walk away? Do you see it? It's right there. Two words, disheartened and sorrowful. This is profound. The guy says, I can't do it. I can't do it. It's too much, Jesus. You're asking too much. That is a bridge too far. Not that. That's where the, he's disheartened and sorrowful and he walks away from him. Because Jesus has just revealed the one thing he felt he could not give up. It's too high a price. And for him, it was his wealth. Matthew 6, 24, Jesus teaches about this. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve God, and you could put almost anything else here. For this guy, it is his wealth. God and what? We, we, the love of money is the root of all evil, not money itself, that's true. However, money's not neutral in the Bible. Wealth is not a neutral thing. It's always presented as a rival God because it has the power to, uh, to compete for the allegiance of our heart in ways that almost nothing else does. If following Jesus meant being an all-around good guy, well, then he doesn't need to walk away sad. He already is. If following Jesus means Jesus just wants you to affirm you and make you feel good about you just as you are, then this is a failure of an encounter because the guy walks away sad. Now, I, I want to be clear about something. The Bible does not teach, and Jesus is not saying that it's a sin to be rich. This guy's problem is not that he had wealth. And some of you are thinking, sweet, because I don't have any anyway, so I'm good. Others of you, maybe you are more wealthy, and you're thinking, oh, okay. None of us are off the hook there. His point is, it has a hold of him in a way that is preventing him from receiving the very thing he's asking about, life. Let me ask you this question. What could Jesus say to you or ask of you that would make you walk away sad? What could Jesus ever say to you or ask you to give up that would make you go, can't do it, and turn away from him. This is the only encounter in all of our series where it ends this way. And there is a sadness to it, but it's not the end of the story. There's hope in, in this as well. I wonder, like he walks away from Jesus in that moment sad, but I wonder what happened to him. We don't know. Pete Scazzaro wrote a book called The Emotionally Healthy Church. And in there he talks about, uh, he references this story, and he says, the story of the rich young ruler is a story about an invitation to surrender completely to love, to lay yourself down fully to the offer of love, divine love, perfect love. It's a scary thing. Full surrender, complete surrender, like to give it up completely. That's, I remember when I was thinking about getting engaged. The next month we'll be married 31 years. And I remember when I was thinking about getting engaged. It's, it's, I, I was pretty sure that she's the one. I was pretty sure she'd say yes. She, when I asked her, she just, Aaron just cried. And I didn't really yet know about the nuance of women's tears. I just thought, ah, tell me yes first, you know. But it's, it's, like, it's a terrifying thing, right? Am I gonna, like I'm gonna give up. Now I'm gonna live not just for myself, but for somebody else. And we're gonna be, like, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna Surrender to love this way? And that's an imperfect example. How many of you that are married here would say that when you got married, you knew exactly how it would go and it's gone exactly that way? <laughs> right? if, if those of you who aren't married, there's a lot of laughter in the rooms. 
because we, none of us know for sure what we're committing to. We'd like, when it comes to Jesus' offer, to be able to say, okay, okay, I'll consider this, but could you lay it out for me how it's going to go? We know ultimately, but that's not how it works. There's a fearfulness. It's nervous. And part of this guy's fear is that he thinks he's going to lose in the deal. Like this, my wealth is too much to give up without some guarantee. Like I'm going to lose out as if it's a zero-sum game with Jesus. It's not. C.S. Lewis writes about this in an essay called The Weight of Glory. I know I quote him all the time, but he says things really well. You should go home and Google this essay and read it tonight. It will bless you. It's the title of a book of essays, but this essay is incredible. It's one of my, I can't say the favorite because I love them all so much, but it's one of my favorite things he's ever written. Here's what he writes. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. Think about that as relations to this man. Is his desire for his wealth is not too strong. It's, his, his actual, it's actually it's too weak because he doesn't know what's coming to him. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. I love that. How often have I, have you, settled for mud pies of lesser things in your life? when infinite joy is being offered to you by Jesus. And that thing you're gripping, like, it's a mud pie compared to what he's offering. And if you'd let go of it, you'd see that there's no losing with him. It's only gain. But you have to surrender first. You've heard the saying, money opens doors, right? That's actually true. All throughout human history, there are undeniable advantages to having wealth. You can provide things for your family, do things for yourself that if those who don't have resources can't do. That's true. But this is a door that money can't open, the door that this man's knocking on. Nobody can open it except Jesus himself. And this brings us to the, the final thing. The, Jesus makes the impossible possible for us. It feels to this guy like this is impossible. What you're asking me, Jesus, is I can't do it. It's impossible. Have you felt that way ever in your life? Getting over this? I I can't do this. Jesus' call felt impossible to the man. He cannot imagine his life without his stuff, his possessions, his wealth. To lose myself, my very soul, my identity, like that's what this is. You're, you're asking me to give up who I am. And Jesus says, yeah, exactly. I want to make you somebody better, somebody new. Look at how uh, the story ends with the disciples' encounter here, verses 23 to 27. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. Now, this word amazed, that sounds in English like amazing. No, it's not like that. It means uh, shocking, terrifying, (gasps) like they can't handle it. Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? There's a question. You hear what they're saying? If this guy's not in, we're in trouble. Like he's a good man. He's a respected man. He's an established guy. If he's not in, who can get in? And Jesus says, yeah, you're right, it's, it is impossible with man. Nobody gets in on their own. You can't, but not with God. With God, all things are possible. By the way, this camel and eye of a needle bit here, some of you have heard that before. How many have ever heard this interpretation that there was actually a gate in the wall of the city of Jerusalem called the needle's eye and it was low and narrow and a camel had to kneel down and take all of its burdens off and it could get through if it kind of crawled through as a symbol of humility. Anybody ever heard that? 
Total bunk, no such gate. That's not true. Okay? <laughs> Jesus' whole point is to use an analogy that sounds ridiculous because he's making the point, you can't do it. Like it's ludicrous for a camel. Have you ever seen a camel in person? They're, they're crazy looking and huge. And a needle's eye, like it's, it's laughable. That's his point. You could never do it. It could not happen unless God intervenes. And he has intervened. Remember the ladder? You can't climb high enough. And even if you got to the top, there'd be this impossible gap between you and God. You could never get there. But that's the cross. You don't have to climb. Jesus has come down. He's, he's come down to us to make the impossible possible. You'd have a relationship with the God, the morally perfect king of the universe has come down because he loves you. And you and I are holding on to mud pies, right? And he's going, let go of that. Let it go. Trust me. Lay it down. Whatever it is. You can trust him. Sinclair Ferguson puts it this way in his book called The Whole Christ. He says, only when he gives us new hearts to abandon everything for Christ will we be free from our personal forms of idolatry and yield ourselves fully to him. Only when he does it can we do it. That's what he's saying, right? It, it, it doesn't say only when we surrender ourselves fully to him will he give us new hearts. No. Only when he does that can we. And Timothy Keller says Jesus is the ultimate rich young ruler. Here's what he means, and I love this. Je Jesus is the ultimate rich young ruler in that he gave up his status and position in heaven to come to earth. He gave up his wealth the riches of heaven, to become poor. Why? The Apostle Paul answers it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. You can trust Jesus. You can let go of that thing and trust Jesus because he's already given up everything for you. So that you could have eternal riches Life of joy. I don't mean someday when you die and you float off to the clouds. That's not heaven anyway. I mean right now. Security, peace, joy, fulfillment, love, perfect love is offered to you. And every one of us is gripping onto something. Jesus wants to reach in there, grab it, pull it out, and say, let me have it. You cannot lose. The exchange is always worth it when it comes to Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you look at us and love us, even in our mess, even in our struggle, our doubt, our fear, our insecurity, our pride, all of it. You see it, and you love us. And you love us enough to tell us the truth. You love us enough to point out the thing that's in our way from having all that you offer. We, we, Lord, help us not to walk away from you sad, but to surrender to you and receive infinite joy. We pray this in your name. Amen. I've thought this over the years. I don't know if I ever said it in the service, that the person who um, prays about plans and leads worship, leads us into the presence of God through music and song, has as much to do with the spiritual life of the church as the person who preaches the word every Sunday. And this is Anton's final Sunday with us as our worship leader. We talked about that several weeks ago. He's and his wife and their two kids are moving to Michigan uh, to work in a different church. And so it's uh, good and right that we bless him uh, and say thank you uh, to Jesus for the work he's done here. So Anton and members of the worship team, come on up here. Touch the tension, come on up. Yeah, come on up here, You, uh, you, you see Anton pointing out worship leaders in the crowd. <laughs> um, so we just want to take a minute and bless him and pray for him. And so Pastor Kenton will begin and I'll close. And you can just stretch your arms out toward him. We'll put our hands on him and just as a way of sending him with our blessing. Thank you, God, for this uh, gift that you've given us of Anton and his heart and his skill and his passion for worship. 
Lord God, thank you for the way that he has guided us uh, towards your throne and pointed towards you, reflected your light. Lord, he could have just sung pretty and all of us listen, but no, you've, you've put it on his heart to empower us to sing, empower us to worship, empower us to truly understand who you are and to worship you in your holiness. And for that, we are very grateful. Lord, we want to grab on and say he is our worship pastor, he's our worship leader, but he belongs to you. So, Lord, we give him to you, uh, to the church at 242, and uh, to what lies ahead, uh, committing him and commissioning him in your son's name. Father, thank you for the way that Anton has made us all better, taught us what it means uh, to worship you in spirit and in truth. And now we pray your blessing over him and Marcy and Arlo and Junie as they go. Provide for their every need, their material needs, physical needs, spiritual and emotional needs. May the church they're going to be not only blessed by them, we know it will, but a blessing to them. A safe place for them to grow together, nurturing their kids as they grow in faith. A place where Anton can use all that you've made him to be for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>